In this session, I'm going to demonstrate how we can utilize formulas to get values or calculations from another worksheet within a spreadsheet. So basically, we want to calculate, for example, the training expenses, get the totals from another worksheet here, for example, under January. We want to get this total and present it and post it on the main worksheet. So we are creating a summary worksheet from values and references from other worksheets. So here's how it works. So you basically have the summary worksheet here. You have the training for January, March, April, and all that type of thing. And uh, also we have these worksheets for each month, for example, January expenses. And you're keeping track of all of these expenses throughout the month in here. Then you also have the one for other months. So the way it works is, is that um, typically, let me first illustrate this in a different way. In H6, let's say we have a value of 55. Now under here, let's say anywhere else here on the right hand side, I want to post this value via formula somewhere else. Now take note of the steps that I'm performing here. It's very easy. To post this value other than typing 55 in there, it, I would need to do the equal sign and then the reference. So equal sign, I go and click on the reference, and then the third step is I hit enter. Again, equal sign, click on the reference, hit enter. Now, here, the, it works the same way. We have the training expenses, and those expenses are under this other worksheet for January called January. I go here, I put the equal sign where I want my formula posted, that's step number one. I go to wherever the value is, for example, this would be for training. Training, this is the total. I click on it, and then the third step is hit enter. I can repeat this process also for office supplies. Again, equal sign, go to wherever the worksheet is choose office supplies here hit enter it's just as easy as that and you can repeat that process now what happens is is that if i went here and on my office supplies let's say they spent more than that and now it came to 7.99 instead of 2.99 uh, 5.99 if i go back to my summary worksheet notice that those totals are automatically updated and that's the beauty of using this functionality. You can do this also another way by using named what's called named references. So the way that works is that for example here under computer expenses this total here I want to name it. I want to give it a name so I can reference it in the future in other locations. And this comes in handy for large worksheets where you could say 2016 budget total. You could name that total and then you can call it from anywhere else in the worksheet. So here we could say computer uh, January computer expenses. So the, what you can do is you go here to where you have the formula or the total and the existing formula within that worksheet for January. And then you go under formulas here and you choose define name. You're just giving it a name. So you're saying this location with this formula, I'm going to call it something. So I click on name and then I call it January expenses. And notice it's what it's doing is it's referencing this specific worksheet, a specific cell, and notice it's also using an absolute reference. So I click OK. So we name it something meaningful here. It has to start to the lower case and it can't have special characters and any of that type of stuff. And then we click OK. Now notice here on the top left, it's actually now for this reference, it's not going to be D7, even though you can reference it by whatever D33 here, but it's actually giving it a name. Now if we go here to cross sheet calculations and we want to post the computer expenses, we could even do it simpler than we did it for these other two options by using the name reference. So now at this point, we are ready to use the named reference that we uh, saved from earlier. Let's assume we want to go here and call the January expenses. And what we can do is we can simply go under the formulas area and then we choose use in a formula. 
and then call the January expenses from here and then just hit enter the other option we could have done was we could have hit the equal sign and then just start typing and notice it will pop up as January expenses double click on it hit enter and it will pull the value that you had from here now if we changed one of those as this total changes notice that the total here will change as well so this is a great way to call references across the worksheet or other worksheets within your workbook or spreadsheet and populate that data for a summary or for various calculations within your spreadsheet and that was uh, using the two methods uh, one of them manually by uh, pulling the values the other one was by defining a name for those references. In this session, I'm going to demonstrate how to calculate percentages in Excel. And I'll have a couple of scenarios here. So the first calculation would be calculating the percentage where a part is calculated against a total amount. For example, in the case of student one scored 87 and they were uh, possible of 100 points, now what is the percentage there? The other one would be the example of a return on investment. For example, you invested a certain amount of money in the, in the stock market or whatever, and at the end of the year you got a certain amount, now what? how many percent? did you gain or lose there and then the third part would be to calculate the percentage of sales increasing or decreased sales and calculate the percentage for example on the discount or on an increase toward a whole so let's go for the first example first here so we have uh, for example student one here they scored 87 percent or 87 points and the total number of points is uh, going to be against 100. So in this case, we want to represent what was the percentage that they got in this. Of course, we could do this without using an Excel formula, but uh, it's on purpose in this case. So we do equal here, and the way you do that is by uh, the first number. In this case, I'm going to do it manually here, uh, B7 divided by the possible points. So in this case, it will be C7. And then all you do is you hit enter. Now, one thing to remember as well here is that when you're doing the calculation, you need to also format this into a percentage value. So, and this I had done it earlier, so that's how you do it. Basically, just click on the percent item uh, formatting, select the range, and then choose the percent formatting or under here, percentage. So that's the first example. So that came to 87%. So this student scored 87%. Now, this is a little bit more complex. We want to calculate the return on investment percentage. So let's suppose that in the beginning of the year, we invested $1,000. Now, at the end of the year, we got $1,200. And we want to determine as to what percentage did we get at the end of the year. What was the return of an investment? Again, format this to be percentages and then you put in the formula in this case we're going to do equal sign basically the way we calculate this if you remember your math and such we do the end of the year minus the beginning of the year divided by what we invested initially at the beginning of the year and we have to put that in parentheses so basically it would be C16 minus B16 or you can click on those as well if you wanted to divided by the initial investment which would be B16 and then we hit enter notice the return of investment on the first one was 20 percent and then if we wanted to calculate the next one you could do it manually or you can do it using the autofill or you can just let Excel 2016 do it for you like it did a moment ago. 
So if I, another way to do this would be open parentheses, initial uh, end of the year investment minus initial investment. And notice it's taking those labels from here, from my table here. That's why I did it manually at first example. Then divide it by the initial investment. Hit enter, it's 25%. And you could repeat this. So in this case, they lost 20% of the investment. So that's how you do the return of investment at the end of the year. That's example number two for calculating percentages. Now in the third example, we want to calculate, uh, for example, we have uh, these employees and this is uh, their annual salary that they had and now we want to give them a bonus or we want to increase their salary. And for example, for the first employee, we want to give $1,200 in addition to what they currently had. So now we want to calculate what was the percentage of increase that they got this year. The way to do that uh, calculation would be very similar to the first example. You just uh, do the equal sign and then the bonus divided by the salary and then hit enter. So they are getting 12%. Uh, the first employee is getting 12% and the other ones are getting uh, accordingly as we see here. So that would be the percent plus or minus here. The other thing to keep in mind as well, as you are working with these percentages, and besides formatting them in percentages, you might want to have the decimal points to at least two. So we want to increase this by two areas. So, so format all of this by increasing the decimal points for all the cells. So now this is more accurate. So for example, employee two got 5.95 percent increase in their salary. If you had to figure out as well, for example, you are increasing the salary of employees by 15 percent or 12 percent or whatever, uh, here's how you can uh, do it as well. So basically, so this would be increase. And we're going to put the number statically at this point, but we're going to do the equal sign here, the value times and then the percentage point. So the percentage point in this case, it was going to be 0.7%. So that would be 0.7 would be the calculation. Now, if we were to increase everybody's salary by 7%, this is what it would be for each one of them. Now, if we wanted to, to know how much is their total salary going to be, we could go back and modify our formula to be um, the salary times 1.07 because we just want to see what it went above what they are earning earlier. So hit enter there and notice now the new salary at 7% increase, it's going to be 10,700 here and so on. So the idea that I wanted to demonstrate here was how to calculate it by a specific percentage so you can see just the increase and this would be by adding the one in front of it that would be what would be the new total for that employee so that you can kind of save another column to add numbers and all that stuff but you're doing it all in one cell for this calculation so hopefully that is helpful there these were three different scenarios on calculating percentages in excel and it should cover pretty much most of the uh, scenarios out there for you. In this session, we're going to learn about using financial functions in Excel. And particularly, we're going to focus on three of them at this point, as we know there are hundreds of them, and for the sake of time, can't cover all of them. So the first one is PMT, which is the interest payment for a period on a loan. Then the IPMT is the interest payment over a period of time. And then the PPMT is the principal payment for a specific period that you are calculating. As we learned earlier as well, uh, the way to uh, find out how to use that specific function is by going to, let's say over here, we want to insert a function and then we search as to what we want to search for. So for example, PMT first. 
And notice, PMT, it says it calculates the payments for a loan based on a constant payments and a constant interest rate. So we click, uh, you can also click on help on this function. It will go to Microsoft and it will explain this further by uh, explaining the syntax for it and some examples and remarks and all that type of thing. So you can explore these for yourself as well, but uh, the way it will work here is that um, for PMT, for example, it needs these values in red in black here. So we need to post those in, in black. So we need to figure out the rate. What is the interest rate per month? So the key there, it's going to be per month. So notice I have this working area down here. So the interest rate, uh, when you get a loan, it would be, let's say, $19.99 or 5% or 30% loan that you're receiving. But yet the rate that the computer needs, it's per month. Therefore, we need to do a little bit extra calculations here. The NPER, it is the number of payments that you are going to be paying. So uh, that would be, uh, for example, if you're getting a loan for five years, that would be a 60 months. And uh, if you are getting a home loan for 30 years, that would be 360 months. And then the PV, it's the present value. And that means how much is your loan? You're getting a $100,000 loan or a $10,000 loan and so on. So the actual total amount that you are borrowing. So, but before we do any of these calculations, we need to have some sub calculations, for example, for the rate that needs to be for the month. The easiest would be to utilize uh, something very similar to this to lay this out. So you say my interest rate is, let's say, 5%. And you have to format this in percent before you forget to do that. Click on percent here. Then it says interest payments per year. That's like your number of payments that you're going to make for a year. That would be 12 in this case. And then the interest payment per month. Now you're calculating this basically by dividing C13, which is the percent rate, divided by 12 or by the number of payments so we could actually instead of using 12 there we could have used the actual reference for it which would be c14 and then we hit enter now notice the other trick here as well is that we are calculating this with uh, a bunch of uh, increased numbers or values here because uh, I think in the business world they use up to five digits after the period. So here we have a little bit more than that but we could kind of control it by this right there. So that would be our payment in uh, interest rate per month in this case. Then the number of years we are taking the loan for five years and that means it's going to multiply c14 which is the number of payments per year times the number of years and it's giving us the npr which is a number of payments and then the pv is the total amount that we are borrowing in this area here, what we're going to do is we are going to calculate the principal payment, the PMT. So now what we do in this case, we go here under formulas, insert function, and we find the PMT option. Click OK. And then we go here under rate. Well, rate, all we have to do is click on it. C15 because we calculated it already. Then the NPER, NPER, it's 60 in this case, so we click on C17. And then the PV, we click on the value here for the amount. And then leave everything alone, we click OK, and it comes to $188.72. 71 cents for $10,000 for five years at 
Now, if we were going to borrow this for 15%, notice it went to $237 over five years. Now, if we were borrowing a loan for a house for $300,000, and we are paying it over 30 years, our payment at 15% would be $3,793. But yet for uh, mortgage rates at this point, they're not 15%, fortunately, they might be about 5% or 6%. So at 5%, you'd be spending, if you're borrowing a $300,000 loan, you're gonna pay every month $1,610. That's why it's important to keep that, uh, to be able to get that good interest rate because that can tinker with it. So that's one way to calculate this. Now, the other way to calculate uh, the PMT in this case without having to do all this work sheet here, which is actually, I strongly recommend that you utilize it this way. It would be by using the formula this way. We go under insert and then we choose here the PMT function and then it says rate. We want to get the rate, but the rate has to be calculated per, per month. So we say it's five. Actually, we click here on the rate. The interest rate is 5%, and then we need to divide that by 12 for each month. The NPER would be the number of payments so if you know that you're getting this loan for 30 years then you could do 30 times 12 so you're saying there are going to be total number of payments for the loan it's uh, 30 times 12 360 then the pv would be the present value the amount of your loan and then you hit okay here and we get the same value so this is a little bit more work to set it up initially, but it's more useful in the long run. This is quicker to get it going, but you're embedding specific numbers and values within the cells. Interest uh, payment for a particular period. That means that uh, we want to know how much interest are we gonna pay on that first payment. Our payment was $1,600 per month. Now we want to calculate the interest that we are paying for that first month. So we go here under and we find here IPMT and then click OK. And then we want to figure out what the rate is. So the rate, fortunately, we're going to use this worksheet that I have prepared, or you can do the calculations like I showed you earlier. So we have C15, that's your rate. The PER, it wants to know the period in which you want to find out your interest rate, what you're paying for interest on that period. So in this case, we said we want to find the first payment that we make. How much are we paying on interest? So we put just number one, first payment. The NPER here, it would be the number of total payments. And then the PV, it's actually the value that you're borrowing. Then we go here and click OK. And now notice that on the first payment, if you're borrowing $300,000 at 5% for 30 years, on the first payment, you are going to pay $1,250 in interest. If you are going to change this to the second payment, notice it's probably going to be a little bit less, $1,248 for the second payment. Of course, that interest is going to drop from payment to payment to payment. So on the, let's say on the 359th period, you'd be paying only $13 in interest. That's why it's important to have as much money up front to pay for a house or something if you can, because you're avoiding a $1,200 interest payment of the first one. So now let's calculate how much your principal payment is going to be for this loan. And specifically in this case for month number one, of course we could do it by deducting 1600 by doing the subtraction from here, but we're gonna do it using the function here in Excel. So the way we do that is by going here under the insert function, and then we want to find the PPMT. Click on okay. And then again, we're gonna use the same 
things. So it's going to be rate, PER, the period, so the rate, the periods, the number of payments, and the present value. So we have the rate, the period, the first time or the first payment that we are making to the loan company, then the number of total payments, then the present value. And then when we have filled out all of these values, we click OK here. And notice it comes to $360 that we are paying monthly toward our principal, toward our $300,000. So in the first month, we are paying $1,600 in total, but only $360 is applying toward the $300,000. So that's in brief how you can utilize the, some of the financial calculations or financial functions in Excel 2016. It's the same way that you can do it in the previous versions as well. In this next session, we are going to learn about using logical functions as part of a formula in Excel. We are going to learn about three different ways of how to utilize the if statement within a formula. The first way will be that if the employees here reach $20,000 in sales, then for those that reach 20 or more, then they can get $250 bonus. And then in this case, we are going to say, yes, that is true for George and Michael and Darius and so on. Then the next uh, set here in the next column, we're going to display yes or no. We're going to represent it with a yes or no, the words yes or no. And then in the third column, we're going to actually post the amount that they get as additional. This is how it works. So basically you have the sales that they accomplished as part of the worksheet. Then you have the criteria that you're determining. This is the criteria. It could be $20,000. It could be $10. It could be $100,000. And then here you're saying this is how much they will get if they pass that criteria. To use the if statement, we can do it by going here under Formulas tab. And then we click on Insert Function. You can also click here under Logical and use the if function as well but we'll use the longer way to start here. So we go here under the if function, and then you could just type if. Now in our case, it's actually showing up automatically here. So if it was not, then it's gonna bring it up. Now if it says it checks whether a condition is met and it returns one value if it's true and another value if it's false. So that's what we want to do here. We're gonna say post the words true or false. So we click on it, and now it says, what is the logical test? The logical test, so we have to say, if the sales, if these guys here, for John, if the sales, that's if B6, is greater than or equal to the criteria, then if that is true, we want to post in there the words true. So notice we have true or false. So we want to just put the words true. Or you could say it is true. If it, so basically you can put whatever you want. If not, false. Now the other thing to do here is to keep in mind, notice that this bonus criteria here we don't want that to change. And if you remember from the types of references, we want to make that an absolute reference. So you press the F4 key to put the dollar signs so that when you use the autofill feature, that does not populate the other cells incorrectly. So we want to lock it to the criteria of 20,000. So again, so far what we did here, if B6, this value is greater or equal to 20,000, which is uh, B12, then we're going to post the words, it is true. Otherwise, we're going to post the words, false. And then the other thing we did, we just used the absolute reference. Then we click OK. Now this it says it's true. He made $20,382. Now we use the autofill feature here to move down to the other ones. And it says George here, he got only 19000 So he doesn't get the bonus and so on. 
So that was one method. The other method is to post here yes or no. The words actually yes or no. It's going to be very similar to the previous option here that we did. So we click here on insert function under the formulas tab. We click on if, OK. And then we, again, we say pretty much what we did earlier. We click on the reference here if b6 is greater than equal to the her or to the criteria 12 we make that an absolute reference by pressing f4 then we put here yes if it's false no and then click ok now this is the first one they did they get a bonus the other ones they don't get a bonus now on the third option here, on the third reference, what we're going to do is we're actually going to post the actual amount, which would be this amount. So, and if they didn't get it, then we put a zero in there. So, again, we go under the formulas tab, click on insert function, and then the if function, then we say if this reference b6 greater or equal to the criteria, make it an absolute value, then they get the bonus, which is B13. Now we want to do that as an absolute reference as well, otherwise they get zero. And then we click OK, and notice the first one gets a $250 bonus, the other ones they get accordingly. And of course, if we are uh, doing additional calculations here, you could have another column here to calculate the totals and for their income and such, and that would complete it. In this session, we're gonna learn a little bit about one-click forecasting in Excel 2016. This is a new feature actually in Excel 2016, and it's quite powerful. If you have a series of data that includes timelines and um, uh, specific values, what you can do is that you can select these values, and then, as we have here in the directions, you can explore the options in the bottom of this and create a forecast for this. So basically, uh, what, uh, what you do here is you select the values from our worksheet, and then we go to the data on the data ribbon here and then we click on the forecast sheet it's going to create a new worksheet to predict data trends and preview different forecast options before generating your visual forecast worksheet again it's new only in office 2016 at this point so if you don't if you're using uh, previous versions of excel you can skip to the next session so we click here on forecast sheet and notice this is the trends that it's displaying what it will be for airport passengers for example and from here you can customize the date parameters and, and others and you can see the trends and the forecasting here so that's briefly with one click how you can use the forecasting options based on an existing set of data In this session, I'm going to demonstrate very briefly how to utilize a couple of the new types of charts available only in Excel 2016. These charts are utilized to visualize hierarchical levels of data with ease here. So we have this data, and what you need to do is you go under Insert, and then you go to these new types of charts. For example, the hierarchy chart is to compare parts to a whole or when several columns or categories hierarchy or when several columns or categories form a hierarchy here so we have for example the major company here then you have the sub companies and then the subdivisions as well so what you do here is you click on it and notice you click on the tree map and the tree map as you can see the description right there it highlights the specific companies and sub areas to them it gives us a visual representation based on the data and notice at this point we can customize this however we want 
as well in new ways all automatically so that was one of the types of charts the other one is if we go back here to the chart type or we go back to insert chart again the other one is the sunburst which compares values across hierarchy levels shows proportions within the levels as rings so this is another pretty cool one as well In this session, I'm going to demonstrate how to utilize pivot tables in Excel. Pivot tables are a powerful feature of Excel. There are a couple requirements that you need to know before you start tinkering them with them and finding that they don't work. The first thing is that the first row should contain the field names for the data that you are analyzing and working with. The second thing is that the records or individual transactions must be in rows very similar to this, for example, the region and all that type of thing. Then the third option is that uh, there should be no blank cells or rows within the data that you're evaluating. So you have to make sure that there is something in every one of them. And fourthly, the data must be surrounded by blank columns, meaning you have nothing in the immediate space to where your data is. So to utilize the pivot tables, what you do is basically select the data. And then of course, you can use this uh, quick analysis tool here if you needed to. And once you select the, all the data, you go under insert, and then you go under pivot table. You could also choose here, and this is new in 2000, Excel 2016, you could choose recommended pivot tables. And then in this case, notice uh, it's gonna customize it by region sum of costs of goods sold by region or by sum of sales by specific individuals or count by products and so on so you could kind of tinker with any of these options as well by using the recommended uh, tables here but uh, in this case what i'm going to do is i'm going to just click on the pivot table here so you get the idea and what it's going to do is it's going to create this is the selection that we're going to use and it's going to create a new worksheet for us to work with and massage and tinker with this data. Click OK here. And now at this point, we could tinker with then any of these options. So let's say we want to see by region. And notice it built the table here by, it put all the different regions. Then let's say we wanted to see by customers. So now notice we have the region here, Midwest, and now we have all the different customers or companies for each one of those. And then we want to see, let's say the cost of goods sold. That would be the next one. And then sales as well. So now we can kind of get an idea here. So we have that data all kind of in a big mess. Now we can make more sense out of it by sorting it out and utilizing, let's say the first one we said here, we used the region. Then we wanted the company for each region and then the sales within each region. Now, of course, you could sort this and do all, all kinds of other stuff. Now, by clicking on this drop down here, you can also choose to exclude certain areas and so on. So that was one type of uh, pivot table there. If we click here again, we can go in and change this. And uh, let's say we don't want it by, by region anymore. Now we want it by sales rep. So sales rep, notice uh, first we have here uh, the companies. And if we want to change the order, we just drag it further up. The sales rep to make the sales rep first. If you want it to filter by a specific region, you can add the filter up here. So I can drag the a region, for example, and make it as a filter. And then I can pick here whichever region I want. It will show me only that specific region. I'm filtering it only for that specific region. And if I wanted to see only the sales by a specific salesperson, I can simply pick here the sales rep and then pick the additional fields that I want. So I can choose a product and see what product they sold and the, the totals and that type of thing. And then if I wanted a specific field to be sorted by or filtered by, I could even pick, uh, add it to the rows here and then choose to sort it at some point later to utilize that field for filtering. 
as uh, you work with pivot tables it's basically going to be a matter of you what you want it to look like what you're looking for in that pivot table and how you want to sort and massage that table for the data that you want notice there's an option here as well for more tables so you could click on yes to that and basically in this case you can choose to analyze for example by industry or by company and you can even choose to detect relationships if there were any and things of that nature remember also that once you are in the pivot table already you can choose here from the options for pivot tables you can pick from one of those predefined ones as well maybe you want sales by region okay there's a sales by region. Of course, you might want the sales rep. There is a sales rep as well that you just added. And you want to put also the customers then eventually. And now you have the sales by region, by a salesperson, and the items that were sold. And then you can also add this product within each one of those. Notice as you're working with a pivot table, so let's say you have this type of uh, table that you created here using the pivot options here on the right hand side. And what you can do as well is that you can create a pivot chart. So it's basically going to take the information from this and build a chart out of it. So notice I picked the pivot chart, pick any of those designs, click OK, and now it built a chart for us based on the selected data. Pivot tables again are very powerful. Tinker with it from the different angles and utilize even the charts within them as well. In this session I'm going to cover a new feature in Excel 2016, that of data gathering. Basically with Excel now what you can do is that you have a website very similar to this for example this is info please and then this is the cost of living index for your selected US cities. Now what you can do is you can go under Excel here and you can go under data and then under this section get and transform what you can do is uh, create a new query where it will link with that external data bring it into Excel and then you can tinker with it however you need to. So you click here on new data and then you choose from other sources and then choose from the web. From here now you need to enter the URL of that page that we saw earlier. So we just copy and paste it and it takes a little bit to bring in the data to connect and then in this case we'll pick table zero. So it shows us the data that we saw earlier, but in a slightly different format here. Then we scroll down here, and then you can choose to edit it and tweak it. Now notice it says that the preview has been truncated, uh, because that's just a preview in this case that it's displaying us. And then you click on Load, and now this data is here in Excel, and you can uh, tweak it and tinker with it and customize it the way you need to and utilize other analysis tools that we have learned so far in the use of Excel. Notice we have this quick analysis. Now we can pick here and highlight and utilize the tools like I mentioned that we have learned about so far. Of course you can create charts, totals, and other functions as well. Notice if you hold the mouse on it, it'll uh, give you some uh, additional information here as to uh, summaries and things of that nature. About this data but the main idea here is to gather the data from major websites out there bring it into Excel and then you work with it the way you need to uh, customize it additionally there are a couple of new charts for financial analysis that you can utilize to visualize the profits and losses against across financial data for example, let's assume that you have this financial income statement here and uh, we select the data and then we go under insert and then we go under the waterfall or stock chart. So we choose this one here, the stock chart, and we'll make this slightly larger. And now notice that uh, the gross profit here is the total. So we go here under the profit, this one right click on it and choose to set it as total 
what that will do is it will bring it down to the bottom of the chart. Then we notice also we have operating income. That's another total. So we find operating income, right click, set it as a total. And then the net income, it's another total as well. Right click, set it as total. And this gives us a visual view of how everything is performing in our income statement. And this is a new type of chart starting in Office 2016 or Excel 2016. In this session, I'm going to briefly cover a new feature in Excel 2016, the 3D map feature or tour feature. So let's suppose that we have all this data that we have collected. So basically what you'd do is you'd go here under insert and then you want to choose this 3D map option, create a new tour. Then in the layer pane, so basically at this point here we have selected the fields that we want. We want under the location, we want the longitude and latitude, and then under the height we want to express here the customer count, how many customers, and then the quarter date, and then you could also specify additional fields here as well if you need it. Now what it's going to do is it's going to give you this map and you can rotate it in every which direction, identify in which states most of your customers are, and look at this data more closely as well if need be. Another option here is to play the tour, which will switch the tour to watch it play. In my case, since I'm recording this, it's going to be captured only in part of the screen, but if I play it, it's going to be displaying the data very similar to this. And in this case, you can identify the areas where you can do promotions or focus on your uh, customers and things of that nature. So it's a pretty cool feature and powerful feature in a business environment where you are collecting a lot of data and addresses and so on, and uh, then putting that into a visual 3D component here. In this session, I'm going to demonstrate how to use one of the simple but yet important features in Excel, particularly when you're using a lot of data that you want to navigate. So, for example, let's say that we have this data file here or this uh, worksheet. And as we scroll down, notice how we lose track of what uh, the headers are here. Also, as we move from left to right, Notice that we lose track of what the first column is here. The question is, how can we make it so that actually the, the header and the first column stay put? Well, there are a couple ways to do it. The first way is uh, basically we could lock only the, uh, the header row here, just the top one. So what you can do is you go under the View tab and you go under the Freeze panes, and that is the feature that you want to use in this case. So you could choose Freeze Top Row and in this case, notice as we scroll down, the top row stays put and we can navigate up and down. However, if we were to go left and right, in this case, it's still not locked this first column. So to correct the problem, what we do is we go here to the very top again, and then we click right below the first row that we want to keep uh, locked and also right uh, to the right on the next column for the column that we want to lock. So once we select the cell that we want to uh, keep as a key point for locking both the column and the row, then we go here under freeze panes and then we simply click on freeze panes. At this point we can scroll up and down and the top row will stay uh, locked and we can scroll from left to right and the column on the left will stay locked. In this session, I'm going to demonstrate how to set the print area in a worksheet in Excel. Typically, in a Word document, uh, you press print and it either the whole document prints out or a selection or a specific page prints out. In Excel, it's slightly different due to the spreadsheets being quite large and typically a worksheet can contain up to a million records. 
So uh, if you wanted to print only a specific area of your worksheet, you need to set what's called the print area. Right now, I've not set the print area yet in this one. So if we wanted to look as to what it will uh, print out or look for printing, if we go here under file and then choose print, this is how it will print out. And it's going to print those pages just like that. But suppose I want only a specific chart or a specific area here to be printed out. In this case, what you have to do is go and select the area that you want to print out here. So let's say I want only this portion right here to be printed out. I can simply select this then go under page layout and then choose under print area and then click on set print area. And at this point, if I go to file, and print. Notice that my preview, it'll print only that specific section. Now to clear the print area for if you do not need that any longer, you click here on print area again, and then choose clear print area. And then you'd have to set it again for other pages or other sections of your worksheet. In this session, I'm going to demonstrate how to encrypt a document or set a password to your document before distribution and sharing it with others. So let's assume this is my document that I want to share with somebody else and I can click here under file and then you go under protect document and then you want to choose encrypt with a password. At this point, you can put your password And the document at this point has been protected. So anytime somebody tries to access it, they'll be prompted for the password. So notice at this point, it's asking me for the password. Now to remove the password, you simply go to the encrypt password again and just take out the password and that should take care of the encryption. In this session, I'm going to demonstrate how you can use predefined drop down lists as somebody or your assistant or you're entering data in Excel so that the data that you entered is consistently spelled and it's consistently listed correctly based on a previously defined list. So in this case, let's say we have a sales rep and you have four or five salesmen and you're constantly entering and re-entering those names and you want to make sure that those names are all the time spelled appropriately. So what you can do is, and you can use this for products and other things as well, what you can do is in another sheet in your spreadsheet here, you can just create the names, define the names. So we have Hubert, Mark, John, Samantha, and Mimi and so on. So now here when you're entering it, you want always Hubert, to be spelled correctly or to have a drop down list of names. So we have this uh, column here. So now what you do is you go under data here. Under data, we want to do data validation. So basically data validation in this case is that it picks from a list of rules to limit the type of data that can be entered in a cell. It can be numbers, it could be a list of names and so on, like I mentioned earlier. So we click on data validation and we choose data validation here. And then under what to allow, you, right now it's to allow any value in this column. However, we can go here under choose and choose a list. Only a list of predefined names can be allowed to be entered in there. So then we go here and it's saying, where is your source? Where is your list of data? And then you simply go to the sheet that has the list of names. In this case, it's sheet number four for me and we go over right here. Now you could pick a little bit of extra space here so that if you add another name in the future, you have the capability without having to change the de design of the spreadsheet. You can leave some of the blank areas here. So then we click OK. And now notice we are back to sheet number three. So now we are entering sales reps. Instead of you typing Tom, 
Notice it doesn't allow you to do that. It says a user has restricted values that can be entered here. So now you have this drop-down list. You have Hubert, Mark, John, and so on. So we click on Hubert, and then you put the date and the item and all that type of stuff. Of course, date shouldn't be allowed like that either. So you can customize that for the next one. So you go to the next one and next one and so on. Now, if for some reason you wanted to add another client or salesperson, remember we had we specified a couple extra cells here. So we go here, we added it on the list. Now we go back and over here, Jonathan is listed as one of the salespeople. So you can use this for products, predefined products for your salespeople and so on. In this session, I'll briefly show you how to link data from an Excel spreadsheet into a Word document for the purpose of reports and so on. So there are a couple ways to take data from Excel and then utilize it in Microsoft Word. So let's see if we can demonstrate it very quickly here. So we go to Word and let's say this is my report. Let's say I have to do this report monthly and I have to take data from Excel and, and put it in my report for whether it is expenses or it could be whatever else. So one of the ways to get the data from Excel into Word is by simply clicking on saving this. So copying it from Excel and then I'm right clicking and choose copy or control C or however you copy stuff or click on copy and paste up here. And then I go back to Word and then I'm going to paste it. Now notice by simply pasting it in Word, it does not look anywhere close to what it was in Excel. Of course, I could go here and choose to use the destination or the keep the source formatting. So that's one way. It's not the greatest way. Now what you can do is you can actually link the data with the Excel spreadsheet. So once you link it once as the data is updated from time to time from Excel from your assistant or whoever else out there that report it's always up to date. All you have to do is open up the document and it will be up to date. So for that to work what you do is you go into Excel. We copy and we select and copy the data. So I'm just copying it again. Those bars were there because I had copied it from before. Now we go back to Word and we click here under Paste, but instead of just choosing Paste, we are going to click on Paste Special. So choose Paste Special and then we're going to paste it as a link. So we are going to link it with Microsoft Excel. So it's linked to an Excel spreadsheet object. So basically the data is not really residing. It's of course posted in the document, but it's linked with the Excel document. So I'll demonstrate in a moment here. Since we pasted it, we can assume that the report is done. We're going to save it. And we're going to save it on the desktop. I call it this my monthly report. Now a month has passed by or whatever time has passed by and Notice my, uh, let's say my training expense for January in the previous report was $100 before. Now I'm going to make it $123. Now if I go to my document and let's say I'll save it. Let's assume that a few months passed by. Now I go into my report. Double click on it. Notice the first thing that you'll get is it says this document contains links that refer to other files. Do you want to update this document or the data from the linked files? It's saying it's linked to Excel. Do you want this to be updated? So I say yes. And now this is my older junk here that I had from before. But notice the expense here for January for 123 has been updated. So the idea is that whatever you change here in Excel as you're keeping track of things, 
it'll be automatically posted and linked with Microsoft Word because we linked that data earlier. So if I go into Word, close it, and then save the Excel changes that I made, open it up again, say yes to update it, again ignore this part, notice even the formatting has been updated from Excel. So it's a pretty neat tool, it's highly recommended that you utilize it in your work. In this video, I'll demonstrate how to import data from a CSV file or a text file. The CSV files are used quite a bit in larger businesses and corporations for transferring data between systems. It's a common file format that is utilized for transferring files. This is an example of a CSV file. It's called CSV because it's comma separated values. So notice these would be the columns. The system will know where the columns are separated by the comma when we bring this into Excel. So let's go back and we'll try to import that. Let me take note where it is located. Now the way you bring it in is by clicking on File, click on Open, and then go and find the file basics. So we'll go under My Computer or Computer, click on Browse, we'll go under Downloads, go wherever it is located, and we're going to choose here to show us all files. So notice it's in Voices list. Double click on it. Now, you'll be presented with this wizard. Basically, it's saying this is a CSV file or comma or delimited uh, text delimited file. So we are telling it, OK, it's text delimited. Usually you'd know that by whoever, wherever you got, the, of course, the file to tell you what whether it's comma delimited or tab delimited it could be either one of them. Now you check this option here for my data has headers. What that means is that the first row of your data actually has the labels as to what that column stands for. Then we click on next. Then we tell the system that this is comma separated values. So the commas are what separate each field. Uh, if it was tab uh, delimited or semicolon delimited or something else, uh, you'd choose that. But uh, most of them are usually comma separated. Then you click on next. Then you could specify additional types of formatting here. Usually it's not necessary. And then you click on finish. Now at this point, that data from a text file has been imported into Excel. And notice I'm double clicking between the columns to make them fit correctly. Notice it's much cleaner. And now you can tinker with this data. You can create charts. You can create whatever you want to create, filter it, and all that type of stuff. You save it, it's done. Let's choose Save As here. Browse where we want to save it. And then we don't want it as tab delimited. We want to save it as an Excel file. So we go here under Excel Workbook and give it a name. It's going to name it listed as invoices list, which is fine. And now it's an Excel format, just like any other Excel spreadsheet. Now at this point, if for some reason, let's assume this is a spreadsheet that you created in Excel. Now you want to send it to somebody in comma separated values, very similar to how we got it earlier. Now we click on file, choose save as, and then click on browse under this, the save as file type, this is where you tell it that it's going to be CSV, comma, delimited file. Click on CSV, give it a name, and then click on save. And you want to keep using it to say yes. If we were to go back to that folder, know this it's with commas. So that's how you bring a file in. You bring it in from CSV and you export into a CSV. In this brief video, I'm going to explain how you can share and export or even print a file, an Excel file into a PDF format directly from Excel. 
So let's assume that this is our file that we wanted. And the first thing that you do is you click on file here and then you choose share. Under share, you can share it with email or invite other people to work with you on this document, but you'd have to have OneDrive configured. And you also have to save this file to the cloud, basically to the Microsoft cloud. Or you can share it as an attachment, directly send it to somebody from here, or you can send it as a PDF format directly from here as well. The other option you can do is you can export it directly into PDF. And this is how the easiest way to print something into PDF without having to have a PDF creator or Adobe or any of that type of stuff. So we click on export, create PDF, and we choose where we want to save it, give it a name, and then it will save it in PDF format. Now, of course, it chose to print there only the area that we had selected to print from earlier on the print area. So that's how you print directly to PDF and share a file in Excel.